I want to take you back in time a bit. When I was a little girl, I was completely fascinated with history. And it could be because I don't know my own background, really. My maternal grandmother came to the United States in the turn of the last century, escaping the programs of Russia. My paternal sorry, grandparents left a small village called Dorechen in Poland um, in the 1920s, leaving their family behind. And it doesn't exist on any post-1945 map because the Nazis came in and burnt it to the ground. So that's one of the things where my background, I have no idea. But in the 1960s also, there was a, a plethora of mass media came in. We had an early morning paper, an early evening paper in my house my father would read to us. And while my mother was making dinner, I'd be stuck in front of the TV set, glued, watching Walter Cronkite with assassinations and riots and Vietnam War, which was ubiquitous in my life. And at that moment in time, as a very young child, I knew that I wanted to be a journalist. I knew that I had this compulsion to find out what was going on. But not only that, I felt this need to tell other people what was really going on and to try and fix it. That's what I thought my job would be. So jump ahead and, hold on. Get the, now we're in the 1970s. And it was a very fortunate time to come of age because women would just be able to get into jobs they couldn't get into before. And this was my chance. At the age of 17, I got my first job in television. And I had wanted to be an ornate talent and cover wars. And I realized quickly on that in order for that to happen, I probably wouldn't be till I was 30. And I was nothing if not impatient. That was me. So I decided I'm gonna become a cameraman. And I call myself a cameraman because women just didn't do that job. Every toady told me, impossible, you'll never get a job. But you tell me things are impossible, and I have to go do them. And off you go. So I did. My first real, sorry, my first real war was the Falklands War. I was 23 years old, and this was a typical picture. Me and all my colleagues were male. That's just the way that worked. The gentleman to my left, your right, you might recognize, Michael Burke from BBC, he was when he was a young man. The gentleman in the dark blue sweatshirt was number two at BBC London Foreign Desk. He was our senior producer. His name was Noel Rankin. This, this particular war would have a lasting effect on my life for more than one reason. I married him, yes, he was my boss, and there you go. Um, what you're gonna do when you're stuck in war zones, not much to do. <laughs> Now, the interesting thing was, we did a small story. We thought it was a small story at the time. It was the first battle of the war. An Argentinian soldier was killed, and we covered his funeral. Um, the body was not there, but we went to the funeral, and we did a small story. Didn't think much of it. This is what you do in war. And sent it to London, went out to dinner. Uh, later on that evening, got this frantic phone call. There's a huge mistake in the story. You have to fix it. Now, everybody was looking at me because my job was to make sure the story was right. And I'm like, uh-oh. And we looked at it and we said, oh, great, there's nothing wrong. They must be mistaken. They're probably looking at something else. And they said, no, 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 it's in the piece to camera. And they said, you can't say what you said. And what the correspondent said was, and this scene, meaning the funeral, may be repeated many times and not just in Argentina, BBC News Buenos Aires. They said, how dare you say that a British soldier might be killed? So the last time we checked, bullets didn't care what nationality you were in war. Sorry. And they, we insisted, and they ran the peace. The next morning, Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher went to the House of Commons and said the BBC were traitors, that our coverage from Buenos Aires was too objective. <laughs> and that's when the moment in time I knew I was on the right track. I knew I could do my job right, and I wore that slur, slur as a badge of honor. So, time goes on, many wars and conflicts later. Uh, it is now 2010, I'm living in Northern Ireland for quite a while. Um, I've been nursing my husband through cancer for two and a half years, and he died unexpectedly on Christmas Day. And I found myself, no family, alone, no clients, no work, and completely at loss. I had no idea what to do. And I knew that I couldn't continue covering ugly things. I'd had enough of ugly, I had enough of horror. I wanted to do something for myself that was peaceful and beautiful, so I did what anyone does. I went to Antarctica. 
Um, my theory of life was go someplace that no one, not many people have been to, to see the pristine nature of the place. And to, you know, I heard some things about global warming and all, so you never know what you might find. I just want to see for myself. So, also on the way, I'm a big fan of Tom Crean's and Ernest Shackleton's. So it was the anniversary, the 99th anniversary of their fateful voyage with Endurance. So I thought, I'll follow in their footsteps as well and see for myself. So it's a long way through Argentina, uh, through, well, you have to go through Argentina, yes, to Antarctica. And on our way there, we'd stop the Gritviken. This is Ernest Shackleton's grave at Vic Gritviken. It's where he died and that's where he's buried. And I'm standing there and I've been on the road for a couple of weeks now by myself had spent a fortune to this trip with my cameras, thinking, what am I doing? I'm here by myself, nobody really to talk to, spent a lot of money, for what? No one's ever gonna see these pictures. Who cares? What a folly. And then I turned around and looked down, and at my feet was a grave. Felix Artuso, you probably don't know his name, but he was the first soldier to die in the Falklands War. Argentinian soldier, buried here posthumously by the British. He was the soldier whose funeral I covered all those years before. I had no idea. And as if he was coming out to say to me, no, you're here for a reason. You have something to say, and you need to go out and see it and let the world know what is really happening out here. And so I realized, yes, I have a purpose. I'm here for a reason, and everything happens that way. And what's interesting is, also, you had this idea of Antarctica, and you think it's pristine and quiet, but, Man goes everywhere, and where he goes, he leaves industrial ruin behind him. And as you can see, the animals, what do they know? But there's hulking ruins, and not only things like, not only buildings, but dangers like asbestos. So what do we do? Do we clean it up? No. What we do is put up a sign. But animals can't read. So what do they do? But things were getting strange as we went further and further south into Antarctica. This is Fortuna Bay. We were told to expect temperatures about minus 10 centigrade, dressed dress appropriately. When we got there, very little snow and ice was left, and it was plus two at a time that this should not be. The animals were quite miserable. And as we went further south, things got even stranger. These are chin straps and Adelie penguins. Adelies are quite under threat, but they were 800 miles further north than they're supposed to be, and no one could figure out why. Something is changing, something's going on. This is Neko Harbor, where the arrow shows, that's where I was fortunate enough to be able to camp in Antarctica and stay for a while. Um, and wherever we looked, melt was around us. Again, we were told out there, dress for minus 30 with a wind. It was plus one. We had to start taking stuff off because we were literally sweating. Not only that, but we were almost inundated, there was a massive glacial calving event right in front of us, um, and the sea came up and we just literally had to run for it. And that's, again, the melt. You may or may not have heard, there's a thing called the Larsen Ice Shelf. It's 10,000 year old ice, 625 miles across. It has collapsed. It is now, will be completely gone by the end of this decade. This alone will raise sea levels a full, full meter. So think about that, this is already happening and this is the way it is. Now, this is near Vernadsky Station, which is a, a Ukrainian research base where they monitor climate change, but also the ozone layer. Now, there's good news here. In 1987, the Montreal Protocol was put into place to ban certain ozone-depleting chemicals, such as CFCs. You might know them from your hairspray when they had to change over. Well, the good news is, it proves they have now found that the ozone layer is healing. The hole, the ozone hole, is shrinking, which proves that every one of us can have a positive effect on our environment, not just negative. So it's something to really think about as we go forward. Now, after having been down to Antarctica, I realized there's another portion of this. I need to go see the Arctic, because I've heard a lot about what was happening with the bears, and I thought, I want to see this for myself. This is Columbia Glacier. I should say this was Columbia Glacier. Um, I put this picture in 2011. The glacier's no longer visible from the sea. And by the, again, the end of this decade, there will be absolutely no Columbia Glacier left. So it is just a memory, really, already. This is, again, this is Alaska. We're not even talking as far up as you need to go. Um, 
So what we now know is 2014 was the hottest year on record until you hit 2015, which became the hottest year on record. Now 2016 is the hottest year on record. To give you an idea, this is, when you see a polar bear, this is the picture, first picture of a bear I ever got in the wild. I cried. He was gorgeous. Well, he was majestic in the fact that he was out where he was, where he belongs. But he'd been swimming for four hours, and that's why I was crying as well, because he was so thin. He, we don't know how long he was out there, but there was no ice from him to, mount, to hunt from. He was starving. And he found this little outcrop in this glacier to pull up on and just went to sleep. And we stayed for a few hours, but he just slept, so we just said, we'll leave him alone and go on. Now, what's happening out there is, in the last decade, in, well, actually, since 1990, we have lost 30 full days of ice for the bears to hunt from. And to give you an idea of what's actually happening out there, December 28, 2015, at the North Pole, the temperature was 30 centigrade higher than it should have been. It should have been minus 20. It was zero. Zero degrees at a time when it's, you know, it is at 32 degrees Fahrenheit at Christmas time in the North Pole. They called it a freak storm, but it's happening every year. So how freakish is it? Now, this is a female and her cubs. We know that over the last 15 years, females have lost 10% of their body weight on average. Some more, not many, much less. And this year in Western Svalbard, which is above Norway, when the bears, when the females and her cubs came out of the den, they found absolutely no winter ice at all to hunt from, which means they had to go start swimming to look for food because she desperately needs food and she's got to feed her cubs. And we now know that we've lost almost an entire generation of cubs because the cubs only have so much energy to keep swimming. And they died. They drowned. And that's just where we're heading. Now, people say, why don't bears adapt? Eat fish. Eat birds. You can even see birds next to them. What people, most people don't know is bears don't eat meat. Bears can only eat the skin and the fat off a seal. Why? Well, you need fresh water to digest meat. They don't have a fresh water source. They're at sea. It just doesn't exist. But not only that, they're losing their whole ecosystem because it's not just about them. It's about animals such as walruses and seals that need ice to breed on. Now, E.O. Wilson, who's a very famous sociobiologist, has recently come out with we are at what they call the mass extinction crisis. And even today, if you look in the newspaper today, they've now theorized, they actually know this for a fact, that two-thirds of the wildlife on our planet will cease to exist by 2020. Think about that. Two-thirds of wildlife will cease to exist in, less than, in about three years, because we're almost at 2017. This is just what's happening out there. So what does this mean for us? Well, first off, CO2. When you talk about CO2, what scientists have been saying for a very long time, the only safe level is anything from 350 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the air or less. And that's to keep the temperature two degrees below where it is going, or, and also for our own for plants and drought and everything else. But three weeks ago, not only did we hit that tipping point, we've now exceeded it. It is now 406 parts per million, and what that actually means is that unless today, this moment in time, we stop using fossil fuels completely for generations, they figure at least eight generations, this figure will not go below that. And what does that mean in the world? Well, that means that according to Professor Fenner, who's a very famous, he's helped eradicate smallpox, his theory is that we are the only species that is evolving itself out of existence. And why? Climate change, overconsumption, and overpopulation. It's that simple. If we do not do something, and it's not just Professor Fenner, every climate scientist is clear on this. There is no argument that human beings will cease to exist as a species within the next four generations. It's just a fact unless we start to do something. What can we do? Well, I'm a journalist. 
For 40 years, I've gone to places to try and find out what was going on and to bring the story to people. Now I'm lucky, my images are pretty, but I'm sorry the message still isn't. Because the message is, if we don't stop the acquisition and use of fossil fuels, stop deforestation, stop an out-of-control population, start moving billions of people out of coastal regions to save them from inundation, where are we going to be? What will we have left? For the bears, it's too late. We know that polar bears will cease to exist in the wild by 2050. That's not that far from now. There are very few bears left, but the reality is, with the melt that's going on, it's happening. And we now know with Western Antarctica that the melt is happening so severely and it's, this whole area of Western Antarctica is collapsing that sea levels will now rise in the next 30 years by 10 meters, which means the whole world will look different. So what I have to say is the bears are fighting for their own existence. And the question becomes, when will we start fighting for ours? Can we turn back that clock? Can we go back in time? Thank you.